Hello, everyone. Um, it's 8 p.m. in Hong Kong, so we will get started now. Um, a very warm welcome to, to all of you who are joining us um, for today's session. My name is Özge Arsoy. I'm the Public Programs Lead at Asia Arts Archive. And for those of you who are less familiar with AAA, uh, we are an independent, not-for-profit organization based in Hong Kong. And for the last 20 years, we've been doing research, archiving, programs and publishing with a focus on recent art in Asia. And art pedagogy is one of our main research interests that we've been working on for about 10 years now. And we continue to do research, archiving and programming about influential art schools in Asia and also um, look at the roles of individual artists in creating new forms of teaching art. And today's event is organized um, on the occasion of our current exhibition at Asia Art Archive Library, which draws on this research of our team and also my colleague researcher Anthony Young in particular. And Samira, maybe we can show um, a couple of images from the, the exhibition now. The exhibition is titled Learning What Can't Be Taught, and it tells a story about six artists from three generations who were each other's teachers and students at the China Academy of Art in Hangzhou. It's an ambitious time frame uh, because we're speaking about a period between the 1950s and 2000s, where there were major political and social changes in the country. And in the exhibition, we're looking at how these six artists have created space for experimentation um, and artistic freedom for themselves and also for their students within the limitations of their time. And I know that some of these artists are joining us today as audience members. So I would like to, to acknowledge and give our thanks to, to Zhang Shangtian, Jinida, Zhang Feili, Dan Jiani, Lu Yang and Zhang Juyun for their generosity to share artworks, archival materials, and their stories. And today, we are honored to have artists um, Ringo Bunuan and Bivi Suresh with us. And we will speak about the, the most influential teachers for their artistic practice. And for us, this conversation departs from the exhibition, and we will focus on uh, Ringo Bunoan's and Bibi Suresh's own interpretation of the question of whether art is something that can't be taught. So our first speaker, Ringo Bunoan, is an artist and curator based in Manila. She studied with Roberto Chabent, the, the late conceptual artist and educator at the University of the Philippines College of Fine Arts in the 1990s. And since her graduation, Ringo has spearheaded several artist-run spaces. And this particular work resonates with um, Shabet closely because he taught his students not only to become artists, but also how to create spaces for themselves. And we'll speak more about this today. And also, I would like to, to add that between 2008 and 2014, Ringo worked as researcher for Asia Art Archive and initiated research projects on Roberto Chabet and artist-run spaces in the Philippines. Our second speaker, Bivi Suresh, is an artist and educator based in Hyderabad. He studied painting at Khan School of Art in Bangalore and continued his education uh, for many years at the, the Faculty of Fine Arts in Baroda and the Royal College of Art in London. He was initially trained as a painter and gradually moved to, to video, sound art and installation. Bibi Suresh is currently head of Department of Fine Arts at the University of Hyderabad, and he will speak more about how his teachers inspired him to develop teaching models for over 25 years now. I would like to add that this is the, the eighth session of our online public program series, Life Lessons, that we started last year in May. And this is a series where we invite artists to share their stories and their personal experiences about learning and teaching art. And we would like to, to thank SH Ho Foundation Limited and CK and K Ho Foundation for their very generous support. And finally, just a couple of words for housekeeping. Uh, we'll have a conversation for about an hour and then we'll open the floor for your questions and comments. If you have any questions, uh, please use the, the Q&A tool of Zoom at any time 
during the conversation and we will do our best to, to answer all the, the questions at the end of the talk. We're also offering simultaneous interpretation in Mandarin today, so please click the interpretation button to, to select the language if you want to, to follow the conversation in Mandarin. So without further ado, um, Ringo and Suresh, thank you so much once again for joining us today. Um, I would like to please uh, turn on your cameras. And um, I'd like to start with the, the first question, uh, which is about the, the early days of your practice and about um, what happened in the classroom when you were a student. Um, so I wanna ask you to, um, to share a story about a class, um, an exercise or an early educa educational encounter that was foundational for your practice. And Ringo, I'd like to, to begin with you. Um, because in the, the Roberto Chabet archive, we see that um, Chabet collaborated with his students through a series of different works. And these materials are quite striking because they already say so much about ideas of individuality, collaboration, procedures, or how to divert from procedures. So can you tell us, um, can you tell us about what was happening in the classroom in your experience? Um, hi, uh, Oske. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. Um, yes, before I uh, well, before we begin, uh, I'd first like to thank AAA for inviting me to join this talk and to share my experiences um, with Roberto Chabet. As Oske mentioned, um, I was his student and I was also the archivist of his work. And I continue to um, to um, work with AAA to improve the accessibility of this collection online um, and sharing the material um, through programs such as this. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I guess first uh, I'd like to talk about how I first met Roberto Chabet. Um, I was 20 years old, you know, I was a uh, I was a student at the UP College of Fine Arts. Um, I was not supposed to be in his class actually, because I was, um, I was an art history major. And one interesting thing about um, our program at the UP College of Fine Arts was that art history majors have to take studio art courses, but only for the first two years. And they were pretty basic, you know, um, on form and technique, um, things like that. Um, Chabet taught third year and fourth year classes. So um, I decided to, to take his class, even though I was no longer required to, to take his class, because for one, I could see what was happening in his classroom and it was very interesting, you know, and it was very different from what we were learning in the first two years and from what I, what I also learned um, in my art history courses. So it was, it was um, very eye-opening. And as I said, I was 20 years old and I was very interested to uh, learn more about these things. So I joined this class and um, I think it was such an eye opener for me because I, 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 that's when I decided I wanted to become an artist because, um, as I said, I was, I was not supposed to be in the studio arts program. Um, but I decided after, after meeting Chabet that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to make art. Um, and it was, it was more than just form and technique or, or style or theme, but it was a way of, it was a way of seeing things. It was a, it was a new language for me. Um, and, and I guess that's how my story began. And so um, 20 years, more than 20 years after, I'm still, I'm still doing what, what I started doing back then. And Ringo, can you think of any specific exercises or pedagogical tools that um, Chabet was using at that time? You know, kind of 
um, something from the classroom that really stayed with you over time? Um, I guess it would be his, um, he was quite known for the 100 drawings exercise. All of his students had to go through this. This is on your third year and it was a painting one course. Um, and what we did was we had to do, we had to make 100 drawings, very fast, spontaneous drawings. Um, and then he would select um, maybe three or four from the 100. And, and then you have, to, you have to translate this into a painting grid by grid, like a three by four painting grid by grid. So it was a very methodological, uh, it, was a, yeah, it was a very tedious process, um, but also very meditative. And it really puts you in touch you know, with, with what painting is all about, uh, working with the material, looking very closely at things. Um, but that's, so I did that. I, um, but then after that, I told him um, that, uh, that I wanted to do something else, you know, that I don't think that I was meant to be a painter because I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, I cannot, uh, I cannot, um, it wasn't the thing for me. So he told me, but what do you want to do? This is a painting class and you don't want to paint. So I said, well, I want to, you know, let me do anything um, except, except painting. Uh, um, so that's, and then he said, sure, but you have to, you have to see this from, you know, you still have to find a way to connect this to painting. So, so that's when I started doing installations and photography and, and that was a real turning point for me. And if I didn't have, if I didn't go through that exercise, um, perhaps I wouldn't have realized that um, there was something else to do apart from painting. Thank you for that, Ringo. And um, Suresh, I would like to, to ask you the same question. Um, I know that you studied in different art schools, in Bangalore, in Baroda, and in London. Um, and I believe Baroda was one of the most transformative places for you. So could you please tell us about the, the artist educators that you worked with there? Thank you, Ozgi. I will uh, briefly, uh, before I enter into uh, uh, Baroda School, uh, I would like to introduce where I began my education because I, and the, the very title that learning what can't be taught is something that art cannot be taught, first of all. We only start doing something that is not being taught to us eventually. Though we learn hundreds of things in the institution under mentors, tutors, but eventually we end up doing something that is not being taught. Uh, I would try to you know, uh, come to that point. Uh, this Kent School, which is something which gave us a different kind of opening, it was a one man. Uh, he's an artist who ran the school uh, where he was fully dedicated, though he was a, a very good artist, but he didn't venture into the commercial and he was totally dedicated to the institution and he was running uh, under one roof, uh, everything. I know uh, our students were there together. And, uh, it was like a home for uh, students. So the way he gave exposure of uh, uh, all kinds of, and it's not just a visual practice, but uh, theater people, poets, writers, uh, cinema, you know, people, everybody were pouring in there because, you know, they used to have interactions. So that was a time, uh, well, it was a crucial time for, for the country. We were going through the uh, national emergency between 75 and 77. Uh, I think uh, that generation where we were all young, we realized something, uh, you know, there is certain responsibility, resistance, uh, kind of because with so many you know, other uh, streams were all were active in responding to the time. So well, uh, whereas in Ken School, like we taught so well in the sense how to draw, how to paint, uh, he was giving introduction to every kind of practice. Uh, he was a brilliant uh, tutor. From there, uh, moving to Baroda was a, a great experience, another experience 
when we thought, you know, well, you learn something to imagine and you paint, you express. But we're coming, going to Baroda, it was transformed. It's like unlearning everything. It was like without knowing I had to discard everything. You know, what I have learned in Ken School. It's like, a, you know, where, uh, and actually we could have sh uh, shown uh, uh, Harpath, uh, first uh, slide who was running this school called Ken School. Uh, Samira, uh, this is uh, Ms. Uh, Harpa, RM Harpa, who was fully dedicated to institution. He was fully uh, not uh, handling the whole school by himself with his own pocket. There was no funds, nothing. He was uh, fully, you know, uh, kind of uh, man for the uh, students and the institution. Well, uh, from there I moved to Baroda, where the first introduction of teachers were Nasreen and uh, Neelima Sheikh. Uh, Nasreen used to teach us, you know, I would say she didn't teach. She didn't teach nothing at all. Uh, whereas Neelima used to teach something to us, show something to us. Uh, Nasreen was somebody like, uh, I'm really fits into this learning what can't be taught. Uh, she made us to, you know, uh, to observe nature, observe things in front of us, see things simply, you know, it could be shadow, it could be uh, just a ground, it could be, uh, I know, leaves, it could be grass, it could be a wall, surface, textures, things like that. She never told us what to do because she left us to observe nature and, uh, you know, practice. Uh, somewhere Neelima was directing us towards you know, uh, certain practices, existing practices. Uh, particularly, uh, we were uh, exposed to the tradition of uh, uh, storytelling, the various aspects of storytelling, uh, taken from miniature, taken from the Ajanta caves, and the whole history of you know, storytelling was very, very prominently was uh, behind us. Uh, no, uh, during the Baroda days, we were uh, constantly getting exposed and learning ways of telling stories of the life that we you know, seeing and observe uh, time. Uh, well, I would uh, bring it up to here, like, you know, it goes on if I, uh, various other anecdotes, but uh, uh, exercise purely in the beginning was these were the exercises which we were uh, doing. And then uh, later on, uh, we had other kind of crisis or a crucial time came in where uh, understanding because uh, it's a very uh, kind of all over the country, it's a vast country and uh, many schools are there in the country, uh, more or less all have a similar kind of uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, we have very standardized uh, uh, life study uh, and uh, still lives and composition and things like that, uh, besides artistry uh, to study. Uh, when we were uh, going through this, you know, we were quite, a, you know, got a little agitated about this still life and life study aspect where we just have a model and just keep on doing it or still lives objects and then you keep doing the same thing in different mediums and things like that. There came uh, another mentor, uh, K, you know, Gulam Omar Sheikh, uh, who actually introduced or gave freedom to uh, bring in our own uh, objects and compose and bring in our own models, put them together with objects and you know, make a, a kind of tableau, of, you know, a kind of setup a composition of a live composition and uh, we could use where we want each of the students had their own elements brought into it so this was uh, something made us to you know to take things uh, look out for a subject uh, rather than putting a subject so we could uh, take uh, whatever we wanted and then uh, look at or uh, you know bring in our own meanings into the uh, subject which was there so this is something which, you know, a kind of change we saw in the, you know, the whole tradition of uh, uh, in the uh, fine arts education. That was one of the shifts that we 
noticed and observed. Uh, thank you, Suresh, for that. Um, actually, the, the stories that you are sharing about uh, Roberto Chabet, Nasri Mohammedi, Nilima Sheikh, and Ghulam Mohammed Sheikh remind me of a discussion that we we had with the artists in the Learning What Can't Be Taught exhibition. And the discussion is about two um, main different ways of teaching art and skills learning. Um, on the one hand, when we look at art education in China, we often see this emphasis on skills learning. So before admitting to a school, students would start honing their technical skills and with the formal education, they would continue um, doing that and excel at this. And on the other hand, there is the, the argument that um, if you learn these skills in this way from the, the very start, you actually limit yourself as an artist. Um, I can give you the example of um, our conversation with Zhang Pei Li uh, in the interview that Anthony conducted with him. Um, Zhang Pei Li is one of the, the pioneers of video art in China and he studies oil painting in the early 80s and when he goes back to school to teach in the early 2000s, um, in the interview he says that he wanted to let his students to first figure out what they are really interested in as artists and then learn the skills that will be required for this interest. And for me, the, the stories that you are telling are very much in line with this way of thinking. And I'm wondering if this was a tension that you somehow experienced, a tension uh, about what to prioritize uh, with the different teachers that you had. Um, and Ringo, in your experience as a student, um, I'm wondering if you were going back and forth between um, these two um, ways of thinking about how to teach art, for instance, or, or I mean, was Roberto Chabet, Chabet was, um, I would say, an unusual teacher, or was his way of teaching um, quite similar to, to the other teachers, so you didn't actually think too much about that skills learning that much when you were a student? Well, definitely he was uh, different from the other teachers. Um, and just to give it a little background, um, uh, Roberto Chabet came from, he was, he was not a graduate of UP, he was from the University of Santo Tomas, um, which was really known for um, like the bastion of, of modernism, uh, whereas uh, UP College of Fine Arts was really more uh, traditional and classical. Um, and uh, both were, you know, technique was very important, composition, all these formal elements. Um, so when, but for Chabet, none of those things were important. So it was more about the ideas. So it's uh, like what you were saying, um, it was more important for Chabet, um, uh, for, for the students to be able to figure out what they want to do, what they want to say, um, what kind of direction they want to pursue um, and not to be bogged down with all of these um, techniques and uh, you know formalities in, in, in art. And um, I want to show a slide. Um, can I, can I um, um, show a slide? Um, this is Roberto Chabet in his classroom. Um, his classroom is called the dirty room. So already that, that, that says something about, about what goes on in his, in his class, you know. Um, it was, uh, it, they, they, well, some people are saying they don't know what to throw at the end of the day because everything just looks so trashy. So this was um, uh, Chabet, uh, and this was in the 80s, and this was in the old building of fine arts. Um, so it was on the top floor of the UP Main Library, and uh, Chabet's, Chabet's room was, was like this. And so it's not the usual, like, you know, um, you're, you're doing drawing classes or, you know, doing um, uh, some formal painting, but it was really a lot of experimentation. Um, and they also had... Um, apart from classes, they also had exhibits in the classroom. So this, this made it really different because um, 
um, it will, well, because it was really like a party all the time in his class. Like every Friday, they would do this um, uh, opening, you know, small exhibits of, of students' works. But it also puts uh, the student in a different frame of mind because you're, you're already um, doing works for exhibition, not just doing uh, student plates, you know, so you take it more seriously. Uh, but at the same time, not to forget to have fun. Okay, thank you, Ringo. Um, and Suresh, um, I would like to continue with you. Um, and I actually think about the, the personal archives of um, artists, educators from Baroda, such as Nilima Sheikh or Gulam Mohammed Sheikh. Because when we look at these archives, we see that these artists, educators, they are committed to break apart what it means to be a good artist. Um, so my impression is that the, the Baroda legacy is not about skills training, but it's, more, it's mostly about opening up ideas and opening up the role of artistry in artistic practice. So if we go back to this question about the detention about skills learning, um, I'm wondering if that's something that resonates with you um, as you, in your experience as a student, and per perhaps not, but perhaps it happened later when you started teaching. It's true. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's like uh, in a Kent school, whatever, we are uh, trained so perfect, you know, we were trained to be very, very perfect and uh, to do things, you know, as, you know, like art student, anything. But going to Baroda again, as I said, that things change. It was not given so much importance to the uh, how to do perfectly, but how to observe perfectly, how to see things perfectly, how to sense things perfectly. Uh, perfect in the sense is up to one's own capacity, you know, sensibility. It was all varied from one to one to another. So it is uh, in this uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, experience. Uh, apart from uh, these, you know, practice. There were other uh, kind of, uh, as I said, there were the various kinds of traditions and uh, uh, which were brought into the institution out of the curriculum, out of box. Actually, uh, there were a, a continuous program of uh, uh, introducing four cartes, uh, like uh, you know, uh, making patuchitra is like a storytelling kind of uh, you know, tradition. Or if you take, uh, you know, uh, 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 folk artists doing uh, toys and things like that, or weavers, or many other uh, traditions, folk traditions, which were there, they were all introduced apart from the mainstream, which was a curriculum, which was set up. Besides that, there were so many other things to absorb. And uh, same time, you know, uh, it is also like, uh, you know, uh, uh, which at that time, it was all these activities like we were just looking at them. I know, well, uh, they're all there existing, but it was not immediately uh, seen as a, an alternative expression whether we could use that. I think it's a much uh, a later stage. I think in this uh, uh, a huge program, it was arranged where even Jyoti Bhai was, Jyoti Bhai, you know, by name. Uh, he and Gulam Amushev both had this program for a one year in the uh, Baroda institution, which went on for bringing in a, a range of folk traditional traditions and folk artists into the, into the premises. They could live there and work there, which was a great experience for us. But apart from that, there were other activities, which was uh, like Gulam Amushev and many other tutors, you know, where actually took us out uh, to take part in some uh, activism and protests and uh, making posters. And so during that time, I know all these things are, uh, we were like as students, naively, we participated, but somewhere all these things reflected as I was saying that uh, 75, 70s uh, emergency, uh, national emergency during that thing. We were all just uh, went to pass through, but it all somewhere reflected as we uh, grew and then what we are practicing. All these things is reflecting 
uh, in our teaching today, uh, where you know, which is becoming uh, an alternative expression, alternative uh, into the pedagogy. You know, it's the uh, the way it was introduced because of the time uh, where it had been taught. You know, very systematic kind of exercises and curriculum to a setup, which was follows uh, a kind of British uh, times, you know, in schools. But later on, it has been changed, you know, with the time. We have become more and more uh, bringing in alternative expressions into the, you know, with the, in the institutions. So there are, you know, which reflects, uh, I mean, like I would say the uh, slide of number four, uh, which actually uh, uh, a theater, I mean, which is actually all students uh, got together and Manisar and Jyotibar and uh, other uh, faculty members all were involved in making this uh, design for a, a live puppet. So it was, I know we all have enjoyed, we have all taken part in it, but today we see that as a, I know, uh, a performance could be a, an alternative expression to express your ideas, express your concerns. Uh, so uh, the way things have been experienced then was different and the way things have been moved on in a different way of solving different aspects of, uh, of our learning. Uh, so then it reflects, and as I said, that how it reflects when we look at uh, uh, slide uh, number five, uh, actually it is a, done by the students uh, uh, work as a protest, uh, covering up the whole institution with uh, black uh, sheets. So now, uh, how how is this sensibility comes in? And it's uh, it's also the uh, kind of uh, open end to the uh, education where it's not just a classroom, it's just not a curriculum, but there are other kinds of exposures, participations and uh, where it gives an ideas and uh, uh, motivates uh, students to come up with ideas of expressing uh, their you know, views and uh, their resisting uh, against uh, the system. Uh, and also this is the kind of reflections which I observed or it reflects in our uh, system, education system. I think I would uh, uh, stop here rather than going further into RCA and other details. But this is actually a great point because um, it's something that I also wanted to, to ask, uh, ask you, Ringo. Um, this idea that Suresh talked about, the, the teacher taking their students outside of the classroom to go beyond the classroom, to go beyond the institution, and in, uh, in your experience, I believe it's about to create exhibitions in particular. Um, so can you actually speak about how this practice of self-organized exhibitions um, that was initiated and encouraged by Roberto Chabet has contributed to your learning art? Um, yes. Um, um, Chabet, uh, even though when we were still students, he was already organizing exhibitions for us not just in the classroom or within the university, but also in um, galleries and, and museums. So, so it was very exciting for us to be working in a real, you know, in a real art space. And, um, you know, I mean, you're, you're a student and you're exhibiting at the cultural center of the Philippines. I mean, that's, that's just like, so wow, you know, so... So it made us really feel, you know, um, like we're not just, we're not students anymore, but we're already artists. And that's how Chabet treated us, you know, um, that um, you're, 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 you're not a student anymore, but you're, you're already in the real world. And, and that, that gave us real confidence and skills. Um, so that after, after graduation, we were able to, to continue and we, we, we had this discipline already of, of organizing ourselves. Um, we know how to set up shows, what to do, how to promote our own shows, uh, things like that. So 
I can, uh, I'd like to show some slides. Maybe the slide number three. So um, this is uh, an opening. This is Chabet with the students at the, at an opening at the Cultural Center of the Philippines. Um, and this was in the, um, in the 80s, I think. Um, so he, he, we were really doing things outside the, the school. Next slide, please. Um, and yes, outside the school also means hanging out with, with Chabet. So, so it was not just like a, a student-teacher relationship, but it was also, you know, we're, we're, we're friends and we're all equal. And, and I think that was... Um, that, that showed that he respected the, the students um, a lot um, and also the, the camaraderie that, that, um, that he encouraged with this kind of uh, relationship with his students. Um, that Tim has um, having drinks at this um, house. Next slide, please. And this we are installing, this is in the 90s already. And we're installing in the art center and like the CCP that this was one of the biggest um, places where you could you could have an exhibition at that time so and every year we had we had an exhibition here like um, it, and it was something to look forward to these annual exhibitions um, at the art center so um, and Chabet was always there you know he was uh, he was a curator who's you know, not just uh, doing things from the background, but he was always so hands-on with, um, with installing and um, all the preparations for the exhibitions. Um, next slide. So this is already, um, um, after graduation, we, a lot of us in the, in the 90s decided to open our own spaces and a lot of the archives of um, these spaces are now part of the um, uh, Manila Artist Run Spaces Archive with AAA. Um, so this is me uh, with Roberto Chabet at Big Sky Mind. So Chabet was always there. I mean, he was um, he was like the 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 special guest of every exhibit opening, um, and he he always showed up, um, always had comments, always giving criticism. And yeah, as, as, as I, I wrote in the, in the essay for ideas, you know, he was really the number one supporter of, of the artist, but also the number one critic. So I think this was um, a, a very good way, uh, you know, how, how, uh, how to learn things, you know, continuously even after we graduated. So I'd like to pause it here for now. Mm -hmm. And Vinko, I would like to, to ask you um, a follow-up question about that. You know, now that you also mentioned about these independent spaces, um, you are currently running Artbook, an independent space in Manila. And this is not necessarily a formal art education model. Um, it's a self-organized space. It's a bookshop. You have catalogs, you have zines, you publish, you distribute, and you also develop communities. And because of that, I guess for me, um, I'm thinking about it as uh, almost like a form of pedagogy in the expanded definition of the word. I'm wondering if you would agree or disagree with me on this. Yes, of course. Um, this is still part of this, you know, um, uh, almost an advocacy actually, like, you know, to, to, um, to teach outside the uh, academic setting, you know, and how to be more accessible also. Um, well, we used to run Big Sky Mind and you know, we were doing exhibitions and all of that. Um, so art books is completely different. We don't want to be, I mean, we can still be an exhibit, you know, uh, the exhibit is always, there's an afterlife and it's always through books. Um, it's documented in books and books can also be like an extension of an exhibition space. You can also look at it that way. So, yeah. Do you find that it is possible to, to do crosswork 
with the, the universities in your case, you know, as an independent art space, or do you think that these are more somehow isolated realms from each other? Um, well, definitely we're, you know, distinct spaces, um, but uh, there's always room for, for working together. We like to work with uh, teachers, bringing in their students um, to the shop to do the research um, because not a lot of the materials are available in the schools. Um, so yeah, we can be an extension. Okay, thank you for that. And um, Suresh, I also want to ask you about your practice as a teacher uh, because you have taught at several universities over 25 years now. Um, you were teaching at Baroda before you joined the University of Hyderabad. So can you share with us uh, a little bit more about how your understanding and methods of teaching um, have changed over time? Have you ever felt like you had to unlearn something when you were in the position of a teacher? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, unlearning is something as uh, you know, very much uh, part of our uh, you know, practice, you know, art practice. One has to and uh, being here, you know, it's a uh, you know Hyderabad University. It's a uh, purely uh, at a higher education, that is master's level, where students come from uh, different parts of. Uh, other you know, stay in a country and come from different schools altogether. Uh, as we know that you know, uh, at primary level, we uh, teach them you know, how to look at things and how to represent things. And but coming to like here, we don't have any such ba background within the institution that is straight off, they come to a master's level. We find this, you know, uh, a very, very responsible uh, position that they have to make them realize that they have to unlearn everything that they have studied in the uh, BFA degree level. Uh, it's a, a, a tough uh, task to, because four years of learning, I you know, uh, all of a sudden in uh, two years' time, we have to, you know, make them realize that we have to unlearn things. So, which is. Uh, uh, I know over the period of time, you know, where it is all I have realized, we are as a, going through from Ken School what we learned and what was unlearned, and from Baroda to going to Royal College, what was unlearned. And totally, they're all uh, three different levels and uh, openings and uh, closures. Uh, and uh, where was uh, in London, everything that was understood as a uh, uh, a kind of tradition of storytelling, uh, very kind of figurative storytelling kind of thing, which was uh, undone in a Royal College. It was more of understanding of gestures uh, of the artist, sensibility of the artist, expressions in a very artistic way, something that you uh, generate uh, uh, on the surface or in the world. Uh, because till then I was very much into a painting, very much into uh, you know, a canvas and uh, things like that. But slowly, you know, uh, coming into a, uh, a teaching, you know, somewhere around the uh, uh, beginning of 2000, there was a realization of uh, uh, there are many other things in the life that we had observed from the home, from the streets, from the you know, life around, there were many things which were not taught in the institution, not taught, taught by any uh, tutor, mentor ever made us fond at us. It was uh, something that every artist want to be or a trainer student has to do something of their own observations in their life to learn things. And because that is the kind of uh, expression that we, and uh, uh, trying to sort of cultivate that is closer to the life, closer to the uh, people, closer to the society. And in many, in many sense, uh, it's not a, a very kind of uh, cerebral uh, high art, I know something that we call, I know, oh, it's a very uh, super uh, I know, art. Uh, it is more of a very ordinary kind of uh, I know, practice or a sensibility that to be developed. 
So now so many such things came from the very from the family itself, you know, observing uh, tailoring at home, or a grandfather doing uh, carpentry at home, or in the street, or uh, vendors who do uh, you know, cotton beating, or uh, many other, or even the knife sharpener who would come around the street corner and uh, color. So it is about talking about 70s, 80s experience. Uh, so all these things actually uh, being brought into the, in my own practice, uh, which also we feel that, you know, uh, how the expression changes, how it uh, goes with the time and with the people that uh, you are living with. So now, we, in that they respect you, you know, we're trying to change every aspect of, even if you take still life study or a life study, which, which I already explained how it transformed when we were students by when we went under Gulam Muhammad Sheikh, how things were changed or understanding. Similarly, those experiences were extended further uh, with certain concerns in the student's mind, to bring it in student's mind that, well, what is a still life or what is a life study for that matter? What is the necessity of life study or a new study in the, uh, I know which is uh, kind of there in the, uh, Indian institutions, that art institution, that any, uh, you don't go there at a higher level, a third year, fourth year, you'll be doing new study where, I know, uh, it is a kind of tradition which is there. So which we, uh, somewhere we felt with the time, it was unnecessary. It is not very politically or appropriate uh, exercise to do that, you know, to have somebody, uh, a nude in the class, uh, and in front of you know, students about you know, a female uh, you know, to sit new. So now, yeah, with the time, there are certain difficulties and the you know, concerns uh, among the people, among the models, among the you know, society, uh, all kinds of questions arises. So in that, I know we uh, made students to walk into, you know, go to this uh, you know, model's house and talk to them and understand the situation and understand the difficulties. And uh, they had a, a kind of resistance from the model that they cannot come out with the time and the kind of uh, media that exists around us. I know everything can I know, go out of hand. So they, I know the whole class ran without a model. We arranged the whole I know, thing like very, very enclosed space for a model and the position and the placement for a model, but a student had to imagine with the experience of, I know, uh, imagining a life study, new life study. So now what happened here is, uh, I know, a certain kind of concept is, I know, brought into the doing an exercise, uh, uh, doing uh, what they want to do. So there is a, a kind of drift or a shift in the, uh, for the whole understanding of, you know, even the uh, excess traditional exercises that exist in the institutional practice, I have to give an, another dimension, another kind of perspective to those things. So this is something which, uh, you know, we learn from the teachers, you know, somewhere at a different level, and then extended it to another level with the time, uh, you know, with the, Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for that. And I actually like to, to pick up an idea that Ringo mentioned before, um, which is about the, the close relationship between teachers and students, which is also something that we wanted to, to open up in the exhibition. And when we look at these moments of teachers and students working very closely and having this um, intimate intellectual exchange, we see that the, the number of students um, was not necessarily quite big, I would say. So in, uh, in, in these moments that we were looking at in the exhibition, the number of students wouldn't be more than, let's say, 15 people. And with this way of working, it seems like teachers are also able to uh, pass on a different sense of sensibility or a different sense of responsibility for the next generation to cultivate the next generation, um, you know, the one that would come after that. And when I think about today's conditions, 
it doesn't seem this doesn't feel fully possible and i would be curious if you would agree with me um, because the scales are getting bigger uh, the numbers are getting bigger so i want to ask you how you actually create this special connection uh, with your community of learners if we don't want to use the the terms teachers and students either um <clears throat> yes i think um it really matters if you know um i mean the size of the class um because in 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 our time we were we were a very small class we were like i think less than 10 um well no in the beginning of the year it starts quite big uh, but it at the end it's a uh, very small people drop out um and um and I think you know because because you have more one-on-one -on -one time with with the teacher, it's you really you're really able to discuss things more deeply, um, and and uh, as I, I showed in the photos, you know the the conversations went um, beyond the classroom, and I think this was very important and you know to um to work with chabet in you know in actual exhibition settings um was very helpful and now now because you know so many there are so many students now in fine arts like i think they have like 30 40 i don't know um, but they have big classes so it's impossible to have that kind of um, closeness um which is you know uh kind of unfortunate and Ringo, would you say that that's one of the reasons why you are committed to, to work on independent art spaces in your context? Um, yes, it's better because that, you know, in, uh, in an independent art space, you, you can also control the number of people. I mean, it's also not, um, you're not dealing with a huge public or, you know, you have, um, there's not so many, so many rules, so you can work uh, directly with with other artists you know and still still maintain that that community feeling and Suresh for you I know that uh, it's something that you negotiate on a daily basis right I mean you have the scales but you also have this commitment to as Ringo said to to build this community of learnings all together so if you could speak a little bit more about that um, that would be great uh, having, I know, like, again, I would connect in, the, in my initial uh, experience of pedagogy was like uh, under one roof is like a, you know, a, a family. And uh, moving to bird, I become more social and uh, more friendly as like, a, you know, equal level of uh, understanding relationship. Again, in Royal College, it was a, a different, more of an intellectual kind of uh, relationship. Uh, now, uh, taking all these things into mind and experience and all that. Now, what I you know, think is there is, uh, in, in today's institutions, are getting more and more reserved in the sense because of, uh, uh, because all the institutions are controlled by, you know, uh, some way, you know, under the government is uh, controlling what the education, how the education policy is what we teach and how we teach and uh, there is a certain kind of restrictions are uh, coming in but knowing you know uh, fine arts having independently because there is nothing uh, uh, as, uh, a definite kind of uh, a curriculum because every individual uh, way one practices art similarly the pedagogy is also practiced by each uh, individual in their own perspectives uh, so that freedom has allows us to sort of uh, bring in a different kind of uh, in you know, uh, artists or uh, uh, experts or uh, to come into the uh, spaces and interact with students or understand. And it definitely uh, it is a, a kind of urgency is there that to have an alternative space. Uh, apart from the, these institutions where uh, you know, different kind of understanding and practice to take place. It's very, very essential. As uh, Ringo said, as an alternative space is very important uh, in today because where things have works in the 
uh, in these institutions are changing. It's not so liberal as it used to be. If today, you know, student has to perform, uh, you know, we have to take a permission. It may not uh, even given a permission to the student. So there are all kinds of <clears throat> restrictions uh, are coming. So we have to do things in a very secretly within our own space. It's not looked or uh, exposed to the outside world, what's happening exactly. So now this is the kind of uh, situation uh, we face. Thank you, Suresh. Um, I have more questions for you, but I also want to start um, getting the, the questions from our audience members. Um, is that fine with you, Ringo and Suresh? Um, so our first question is coming from an anonymous attendee um, who's thanking you uh, for the conversation. Um, and they're asking, how would you reflect upon your experience in educational institutions both as students and teachers in terms of the learnings that you gathered around the economic aspects of occupying an artist position in your respective socio-political context. Um, so mostly about the economic aspects of the, the position as an artist and what kind of relationships were imagined with art education and the market and how did they play out? And especially thinking about the, the practices of self-organizing group exhibitions and performances or setting up artist spaces that appear throughout the conversation. Uh, Ringo would be starting. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess uh, if, if you're talking about the economic situation in uh, in the 90s, you know, uh, when we were students, it was the, the art scene was very was very different uh, then. There, um, one, there was uh, it, the art market wasn't very strong in the Philippines yet. There was no market for contemporary art. Mm -hmm. There was no market for um, young artists. So unlike now, so. Um, now it's actually very viable to 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 practice to survive being an artist. Um, unlike before, we were always um, doing all sorts of job and you know trying to maintain your your practice and trying to maintain an art space. And everybody was contributing, and everyone was like um, you know uh, chipping in uh, time, resources. Um, um, yeah, so um, the position of the artist has definitely changed, um, but I think um, the position of artist run spaces, at least in the Philippines, is still kind of precarious for me because um, uh, you know they're it's they don't have um, I mean comparing it to to, let's say the galleries which are very dominant in in the philippines so there's still two different worlds for me uh, if i had to continue with this question please uh, i hope uh, ringo had finished what she wanted to say yes <laughs> uh, uh it's a uh, i know uh, knowing uh, that uh, we are living in a country with a very vast uh, and a, a class and community religion. Uh, the, in the fine arts particularly, uh, whosoever comes, uh, there is a kind of up, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, low and uh, high levels of you know, mix of uh, class is there. But coming to the uh, fine arts, there is a something over the you know, very soon it's a sort of melts down to uh, a kind of single uh, a platform, single community, single, you know, there is no any kind level of uh, class or hierarchies uh, comes in. Somehow, uh, because of the art practice and kind of, uh, you know, culture that exists in the fine arts, it's totally nullifies any kind of, even though they come in the first phase, they feel they try to put their front whatever they are, but eventually it all becomes a thing. And knowing that, you know, with the time in the country, you know, when we were students, 
uh, hardly there was any gallery system exist. Uh, we didn't even think that you know I would be selling work outside or uh, put up a show in a gallery and think. And gradually, I think in the early 2000s, somewhere the uh, boom came to country of, uh, and it also fell off. You know, uh, it's like a, over the night it happened and it was like a dream. Uh, it all get got you know, over. But now, uh, you know, this uh, kind, there is an economical uh, crisis, which for, you know, students who came, rushed to the system, Oh, fine arts has got a, such a great, uh, you know, lucrative, you know, uh, uh, position, and uh, one can make money things like that. Eventually, they have to sort of, you know, there's not much openings or a market for art. But then, uh, they all are going through crisis, you know. But then they are finding a way, or we are encouraging them to be a kind of community practice, you know, like uh, having their studios in the uh, cities and you know, wherever in Baroda, there are about uh, uh, 3,000. I mean, they say that about 3,000 3, uh, artists who are studied and settled there, having a small, 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 small community group of artists uh, working together. And there are setups of uh, institutions, private institutions like uh, Brings Artists and uh, a kind of programs that they host, you know, to kind of uh, active participation for young people to take part. And so now uh, uh, this is something which uh, I know for one way of encouraging students uh, today who are passing out. Uh, it's not just to look out that they have to look for a gallery system, but there are other uh, practices or independently as a community, uh, they can do uh, uh, a different kind of contribution to the society or uh, other responsible artists uh, in the time. Uh, so this is how that uh, one sees the transformation which is uh, taking place in the, uh, in the, you know, in the, the institution, around the institutions. Um, and we also have a question about publishing uh, from Dar Christoph, uh, who says hi to you, Ringo. Hi, sir. Uh, and um, so he's saying that this is in regards to, to the part where Ringo talked about how publishing can be considered as exhibition making. Um, and I agree with that, he says. In my practice as well, I always see books as a form of space, as a form of institution that I can explore and redefine. And his question is, since we are in this pandemic, would you think that publishing is something that institutions can look into when it comes to distributing artworks? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, the publishing is, is always very important for me. Um, but of course, um, there's limitations. I mean, there's, you know, going print uh, to, to publish in print or whether to publish uh, digitally. Um, uh, both have, both are good, you know, both serve their purpose. But I think, um, now that we are in this pandemic, it's great that we're able, we can easily share material online. Um, since uh, if we don't have access to the physical bookstore uh, or to the physical material, so we can, we can do um, a, lot of, a lot of publishing online. And uh, it's also not very expensive compared to uh, publishing um, print books. Uh, Suresh, would you like to, to take that question as well? Yes. Um, yes. Perhaps I can ask you about the, um, the graduation projects uh, and the way that you think about how to share with them with the larger publics. As Ringo said, you know, due to pandemic, things have changed, perceptions have changed, how to present, represent one's body of work or oneself. You know, we are all uh, come to a, uh, virtual platforms. And uh, this time, we never had that practice in the institution to have a, to go on. It was always art had to be physically put and uh, experienced. But uh, due to a uh, uh, pandemic, the, the very display could not take place, you know, finally as students. So they all ventured, I mean, like into, uh, there was no other way. So we had to make a, a kind of online uh, exhibition, putting up a, you know, a portfolio, uh, 
uh, virtually you know, to uh, bring in. So now, not only that, even uh, the very education, very interactions with uh, the whole uh, curriculum that is set up, uh, has made us to change uh, our own curriculum, uh, where we approach, where we uh, deliver our you know, uh, classes, uh, has changed uh, uh, due to this you know, shift, which we had never had imagined that something like this we would be doing on online uh, teaching or interacting to the students, which we have not seen for last, uh, you know, only lately we have brought in some uh, final semester, fourth semester students. Otherwise, uh, last six months or one year, we had, we didn't see the group of you know, batches of students, but everything went on uh, online. And there's a kind of new, uh, a kind of uh, interaction and uh, uh, curriculum which is uh, shaped up uh, due to this, uh, uh, in this time, uh, which is uh, interesting, I know, uh, where we are brought in all the uh, digital uh, interfaces and digital understanding expressions that is like a sound or a, a video or a interactive uh, digital art and things like that. So many other things because uh, it's somewhere it's becoming relative. Uh, maybe earlier things were there when we introduced, maybe, you know, it's not for me. Uh, I know a kind of resistance would have come from a student feeling that, you know, well, I'm happy to do paint and I'm happy to do sculpture, but now, because of a kind of language and the platform, it's still becoming a kind of relative expression to deal with these aspects and you know, other things. So now, uh, some way, I know this change has uh, 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 crept into the, uh, with the time, you know, even though we didn't plan, uh, though we wished we wanted to, but it never happened. It never materialized, but uh, the time has brought the, uh, wish and it would be the dream to come true. Uh, we are several questions coming in. So thank you everyone for your questions. So I would like to continue with them. Um, there's an anonymous attendee who's asking, uh, would it be possible to share a moment when the outside world, uh, outside in quotation marks, uh, outside world of practice of art compels a re-evaluation of the possible obsolescence or a feeling of outdated of the teaching materials and methods, teaching materials and methods, yeah. Uh, Ringa, you first. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think uh, when I started, you know, uh, exhibiting um, outside the school, uh, and uh, becoming a you know practicing artist, I realized that there are so many things that they didn't teach us in school. You know, um, not with Chabet, but with my with the other um, teachers. You know, like um, there's there is something really lacking. It's like there's a there's a like a split between like you know what happens in school and what happens in outside world so there's a lot of practical um, knowledge that that um, was not given to us like you know how to um, um, how to let's say uh, you know how to approach a gallery if you want to show your work or um, how to document your own show and things like that. So um, it was a good thing that Chabet was uh, teaching us this uh, through through actual doing. You know, he didn't teach us like how you're gonna do this, but you know, but the the mere fact that we were already organizing our, ourselves. So and that's how we that's how we learned these things. So it it um, supplemented what what we didn't learn in the formal classroom. Uh, to continue uh, uh, this question, uh, see, there's something which I am more into a, a practice, practical. So, what is new or what is that we, you know, with the time? Uh, uh, there is a technique, uh, is also important in, in whatever language, in whatever perception, uh, the technique is there. Uh, there is a certain 
uh, understanding and knowledge you require to express, whether you conceptual uh, work or even the every tool, I know, uh, to be a very appropriately uh, used in, in conceptually placing the tool also. For example, uh, uh, I know there's a work, uh, A6, uh, Sh Shamira, I would request you to show uh, image A6. Uh, no, no, now uh, it is a, a, a or okay, this is, uh, I thought it was uh, seven, uh, the previous one, either this could also be, let it be, or this one. Uh, where uh, the painter you know, uh, had to uh, go with uh, you know, uh, with his subject is about uh, social uh, and the society and uh, it was displayed in a public place. Uh, it almost becomes a, a part of the uh, public uh, you know, the whole the previous one actually I'm talking about the previous one, uh, the display which has been done in the uh, uh, in a public space. Uh, so now, uh, the, the, they have to learn to, uh, to using material as a tool, and uh, it's not the tool, you know, brush or a, uh, a chisel. Uh, it's about uh, uh, other things becoming a tool to uh, express an idea, uh, a sensibility. So now, uh, tools could be anything. You know, uh, from the in, from the life around you, it could be various things, not as a material, but as a tool to put an idea, to express an idea. Uh, so, so uh, these are the uh, kind of shifts that we are uh, very, very uh, essential in today's uh, you know, pedagogy, you know, teaching for the uh, the generation, uh, present generation, where they had to deal. Uh, in a different way when they step out and you know, there is a necessity of a different kind of, uh, you know, with the time uh, they have to learn a different way of understanding uh, then the importance of technique or importance of tools uh, in a differently, in a, in a conceptual, uh, you know, setup. So this is uh, one that next to a slide is there, you know, where, <clears throat> Next slide, that is a performance. So like here also like things which I was saying that how one observed when we were students doing an entertainment and on the stage, you know, a puppet, live puppet show, things like that. How it is being come into a observation in the light, you know, some, you know, theatrical uh, act, which is brought into a, a studio within the open air space, uh, students trying to express uh, certain ideas. So now, uh, the way the gestures, I know it's not the only gestures in the images that they paint, but how one sees a, a kind of free moving forms or moving images you know, in various different uh, perspectives. Even this would be a pursued as a, a kind of forms, you know, uh, which they put their self, body itself as a form to express something. So now, uh, this kind of understanding uh, in the present, you know, uh, TNO in the institutions is becoming more and more important for us to sort of uh, give an exposure to such things. You know, we, uh, we have to, you know, give freedom for such uh, explorations uh, in the institution. Yeah. Uh, I stop here. Thank you for that. Um, we have three more questions coming from our participants, from our audience members. And um, the next question is for Ringo um, from Basvi Oza. And um, she's asking you, Ringo, to speak a little bit more about the, the dynamics um, and dialogues between painting, art practice, and art history. In, in your student days uh, with regards to, to Southeast Asian art practices as part of the, the pedagogical exchanges. And uh, the second question, I would like to, to add that as well. Um, any women artist teachers around that time um, in the 80s and 1990s? That's the second question. Okay, first question. Um, for me, I'm really um, 
I'm I'm really glad that the uh, the program that that I had uh, with the UP College of Fine Arts um, that that art history was not separated from the studio arts. For me, this was a very good um, way of teaching um, because actually there's another art history program in the University of the Philippines, and this is under a different college. Um, that's a um, it's under the art studies uh, college, um, but there are more, um, let's just say there they, they, they learn about art by reading. Um, in fine arts, we learn about art by not just by reading, but by making it. So um, for me, that's, um, um, I, was, I, I, I think that's, that's quite special. And I'm not sure if, I'm not sure about uh, how they do it in other Southeast Asian countries, um, but uh, in my case, uh, it was like that. Um, second question, yes, uh, there were other women artist teachers um, around that time. In the, in, in the art history department, um, I had several uh, women teachers in the but in the studio arts department, I was um, I only studied under the uh, male teachers, but um, I have no problem with that. Thank you, Ringo. Um, our next question is from Raki Paswani, um, and she has two questions. The, the first one is for Suresh. Um, and she's asking, in Baroda, what were the, the actual shifts in classrooms when the, the nomenclature of the degree moved from fine arts to visual arts? So that's the, the first question. And the, the second question is uh, for both of you. Um, how do you think about how the privatization of education has shifted the classrooms, studios, and institutional spaces um, of art education? So Suresh, uh, to, perhaps we can start with you. To, to answer the first one. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, what was like I was trying to express uh, that, you know, in my talk that how things shifted uh, understanding of art practice. So where was always being a kind of art use had to uh, in, be very imaginative in terms of, uh, you know, something that is being, uh, uh, worked out uh, an image or uh, uh, to express uh, ideas with your own imagination. I think in a visual practice, when you could say actually the shift comes in that we are trying to sort of look at the uh, world around you, uh, look at the uh, life around you, and then you search a meaning or you interpret something through the existing material that comes to you. I think that is what uh, happened in the shift of uh, very uh, still life and the life study uh, shift that took place was a, a real, uh, and a diff and it, it really uh, decodes uh, what was uh, earlier, uh, you know, uh, pedagogy and the shift in the, you know, when it changed the title visual art study. So somewhere uh, this, uh, you know, approach uh, has, well, it's a very organic development. It's not that, uh, uh, you know, some way uh, straight off or, a, uh, you know, some way ruptured in take place like that. It's a very organic development with the time and the way things were happening outside the institution, the world of art, you know, art world, which is transfer and it reflects in the institution. It's not that institutions alone, uh, you know, leave and uh, produce uh, you know, uh, still art artists, but it is also reflects with the time that is happening outside the institution. So now uh, that is a kind of a organic development, I would say, uh, for the first uh, question. Uh, the second was I uh, was meant for Ringo for me, or is it for both of us? Uh, for both of you, who would like to take it. It's about the privatization of education and how it changed the. Um, um, the studios, the classrooms, and art education in general. Ringo, would you like to speak about that one? Or maybe later? Um, 
Maybe, maybe Suresh first. <laughs> well, I, I think in the Indian context, I know, uh, most of these institutions are there, larger institutions, they're all public institutions, you know, and uh, very, very controlled by, uh, you know, government funds. And uh, we don't really, you know, in that way, your private institutions could be, uh, would be much more freer and, uh, uh, to, to you know, uh, uh, bring in new uh, pedagogy or develop new ideas and uh, you know, uh, conceptualize uh, a different uh, system altogether. So uh, it's a, I think uh, uh, a private institutions, as I was saying, that we need an alternative spaces. Uh, it could be you know, uh, independently by a group of parties or community believers. Uh, would be having an alternative spaces. There are a lot of uh, institutions here, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, regularly put up a program. It's like, a, uh, and all over the country, there in the world, there are many institutions which are independently, uh, you know, believing in a, a new pedagogy and uh, system. It's like one Shanti is doing here, or, uh, you know, uh, one in Beirut, uh, uh, I forgot the name, I know. Uh, uh, Askal Alwan. I know they're all in the institutions or even in ASA, young people are coming together and uh, you know, uh, doing programs, you know, working, uh, conducting programs for young people to participate and uh, educate them and bring in new sensibility in the practice of you know, art practice. So now uh, I think the, you know, I would see a private in this, not in terms of uh, industrious uh, kind of privatization. It's like there are in the, you know, private institutions who may be wanting to make money or uh, just a, a kind of uh, industry. Uh, I'm not interested in uh, that kind of uh, privatization. Uh, but if there are private, uh, you know, independent institutions purely believing uh, new pedagogy and new, uh, you know, uh, bringing in new sensibility in the practice and understanding art and practice. Uh, well, it is good, good to, you know, positive uh, theme it is. But there are two kinds and the edges are there to this privatization. You know, uh, it can slip off from our hands or it can even be you know, independently uh, be something very positive. Also. Um, perhaps I can read the, uh, the remaining two questions and Ringo, if you would like to go back to the question of privatization, we can perhaps merge the, the answers if you're interested. Um, the, the first one is from Kathy Lowry. Hi, Kathy. Um, and she's asking about the, um, I think it goes back to, to what Suresh, you were speaking about how to use the digital realm. Um, so she's asking if there are some advantages to, to online arts presentation that you might continue after the pandemic. Um, she says that she's an advocate of hands-on work, mark making, observation of nature, physical space, uh, but there is also a lot of real life happening online for younger people in particular. So that's a question about the virtual realm. Um, I also would like to, to, to read the, the last question because I'm aware of time. And the last question is about the, the regional exchanges um, for schools and for students. Uh, and the question is, how do you think art and education varies from region to region? And do you think regional artwork can um, help oneself to develop um, than other regional artworks help develop artists? If, one second, I'm missing one part of the sentence. Um, how these regional art, uh, artistic practices can develop if there are no um, student exchange systems? So that is the the second question. So if you would like to, to answer either of them or both of them, um, I would like to leave it to you, please. Um, I, I guess I will start. Um, I, I'm also an advocate of hands-on work. Uh, I mean, uh, for me, nothing compares to working in a physical space uh, and seeing art like, you know, face to face. Um, so I'm also trying to, um, adjust to this, to this new system of, of working. Um, 
uh, I think it's it's quite challenging uh, this online arts presentations to be to be honest. Um, but we're you know, and you know we were sort of like suddenly forced into this into this uh, situation because of the pandemic. Um, so I guess a lot of us are not prepared to to um, you know to to work this way. Um, so it's, it's, it's a learning experience, I think. Um, and uh, I, I'm hoping one, you know, I'm hoping we can go back uh, slowly uh, to, to, the, to the real life, you know. Um, I don't wanna, I know there's also a lot of things happening online. Um, there's too much happening online. I mean, you can't act, you can't even keep up with it. That's um, one thing. Uh, but I don't want to generalize, you know, like for young people or for older people. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a transition, and uh, I think we just have to have to work with it for now. Uh. To continue with uh, this, uh, uh, it's not just because uh, a pandemic, but uh, it's already been uh, trapped in in the society that is uh, a cell phone, I know, which is becoming uh, almost uh, taking one to so close to the life. I know whether you want to, people want to record songs, or record incident, or record moments, and. Uh, for a memory's sake and for just for the media publicity of they you know uh, record an incident and then put it up so no uh, this very uh, thing of being you know taking so close to the life it's not even an imagination it's so real you know uh, somewhere uh, 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 we are encouraging uh, because of the pandemic we say that we want to do something uh, digitally work you, we we cannot uh, provide you a space to do. You, you, people are staying, living in some remote places. They don't have a studio space at home. They're you know, sitting in the veranda outside the doors and uh, talking to us, discussing to us. And now the cell phone being a, a sword so much like we ever, never in the uh, previous times, you know, people went so close to the life as much as uh, the phone takes you to the real life. You, know, you cannot you know, cook up something. You cannot just create something from your mind. You have to deal with the reality. You know, whether you take a sound, whether you take an image. So now there's a different kind of sensibility uh, to work with, to deal with the real life. You know. So now uh, this is something which is, uh, there's a kind of uh, a transformation uh, or understanding or a sensibility that students are bonded to deal with the reality, deal with the problems of the real problems, and uh, to express in a uh, in a in a certain uh, realistic way. And uh, it's not uh, uh, something which is being imaginated uh, thing. So then, even if they take uh, an image, and then how do they appropriate? That becomes a a, a, a kind of exercise or a sensibility to and, and or develop uh, to uh, validation and appropriation of the images they take and uh, what is that they want what is it also brings in a, uh, a kind of critical uh, a sensibility of you know because they are dealing with the real things not something that they have produced so they have to have a different kind of uh, understanding and uh, you know appropriation of the material that they do. I think it is an interesting uh, shift that has taken uh, in this uh, pandemic time. Uh, digital, what we are talking about digital. Digital, not necessarily, uh, you know, of just a photography or uh, video. It could be, you know, uh, varied in a kind of, uh, inter you know, a kind of mediation. Uh, it's not really uh, to be uh, purely uh, digital, digital. It's a, what we are thinking of with a mediation, digital mediation in your practice, in your expression. 
it could be interactive. I know we introduced the sound, we introduced various kinds of uh, uh, video mapping or uh, interactive sound, you know, like programs, which are many uh, uh, things are there, like Max MSP or things like that. Well, we try to give them exposure to them to sort of how these things, you know, which works on a digital platform and also allows them to sort of uh, interact and be, it's not just digital is not, you leave your hands, but somewhere you have to use uh, your mind also to how you control, uh, how, what it has to, and the computer has to do with your pro, you know, program. So you have to build, you know, put your mind into it. It's not just simply uh, you created and left your hands and the computer will do so. There is a certain kind of control of your mind with the, you know, digital interface. Thank you for this. Um, I'm aware of time, so we will have to, to wrap up quite soon. But perhaps for the, the last comments, um, I actually want to go back to an idea um, that we also discussed briefly with you before, an idea, the idea of the artistic lineage. Um, and if I can just say just a couple of words about how we think about it in the exhibition, is that we have these three generations of artists and when you look at the, the artworks in the exhibition, when you look at the, the works across generations, you don't immediately see a formal or a stylistic connection. Uh, but there is a connection when it comes to an artistic attitude, which is more of a commitment to, to experiment or to create um, a unique artistic language and also the sense of responsibility of um, teaching or cultivating younger generations, which we talked about today. Um, so the lineage is not necessarily about the, the artworks or the styles per se, but it's about the attitude. And maybe for the last comments, I would like to ask you if this type of, um, this idea of artistic lineage resonates with you in your practice, and then we can wrap up after that. I hope it's not big of a question for the last well, it's a big of a question. It's a big question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah disclaimer. <laughs> uh, Ringo, would you start or? Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to to start with that question. Um, but yes, I think it's um, attitude is definitely passed on. Um, and one, one, one thing that I really, um, uh, you know, learned or unlearned from what I got from, from Sir Chabet, you know, um, was this really, uh, this attitude of um, really doing things for yourself um, not, and not, um, not waiting for, for things to happen. You have to make it happen. So it's a very proactive um, position. Um, and also this, uh, this idea of, of that you have to share things, you know, you, it, it doesn't stop with you. So you have to pass this on to other people, you know, share the knowledge, uh, share what you have, share the resources and yeah, think about uh, it's it's quite challenging. Uh, it's getting more and more challenging now, um, mainly because um, um, there's so many artists already. You know, it's it's before we're just you know few people. You see each other almost every day. You know, so um, it's uh, different. But definitely, it's um, this this attitude that that I hope will, can be passed on as well, you know. But then, um, then again, I'm quite conflicted about, you know, this idea of passing on the torch. Um, because I think we, we all have a light in us, you know, to, to, to carry, you know, it's not just something. And we all contribute to this, to this, um, um, to this light, you know, to this, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, uh, in, in, other, in other words, you know, uh, we often, uh, I often say to the students that, you know, you cannot do something different, something new. Uh, it only uh, realizing where you left, where you, you know, uh, where. Uh, only from there you can step ahead. 
So in that sense, you know, the, the lineage within in a larger context historically also, it's very uh, important for us to uh, see uh, before we step ahead or to think of a new uh, or a development. And we have to uh, be uh, where we were and understand what was left behind us. So it's so important for the students, even in the studio, that uh, when they shift from one place to another place to another institution, somewhere they have to realize fully that where they have left. I know they often come here and say that, uh, I don't know what to do now, and I'm in a new space, new environment, a new tutor, you know, mentors, a new system. Uh, I want to do something different. And it's, it's, in, it's not possible. It's not possible to do something different or new unless you uh, get back to where you were uh, left. And then uh, if you can move, that has a very, very uh, systematic understanding and uh, a realization and your, your position is very important in doing things where you are. So that only comes by looking back uh, where you come from or where you left. It is, I think it's very, it was an interesting question. It's very important. I think this is a quite a great moment to, to end and um, I'm sure we will keep talking about these, um, these questions and um, I want to thank everyone, uh, but a very warm thank you to, to Ringo Gunoan and Bivi Suresh once again for this conversation. And thank you to, to all of you for joining us and for your questions. Um, and finally, I also want to acknowledge the, the AA team who's behind the scenes right now. So thank you Garfield, Samira, Susanna, and Paco, and to Anthony, Sneha, and Chungdai for their support as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, have a good day, everyone, and we really hope to, to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>